Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for truth, your word, that if we abide in it, we'll know the truth and be set free, which is true. Speak to us this morning. Within Yeshua, we pray. Amen. If we could turn to these, these are verses that need to be uh, in, marked in your comu in computer. Yeah, do that too. Uh, everybody reaches for their phone. But uh, 2 Timothy, please. Chapter 3. 14 through 17. Mrs. Davis, will you do that for us? You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing that from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Okay. All scripture. Um, all, unless you're a Calvinist, means all. Sorry, I'm being bad. Because they will say, yeah, I, anyway, I'm not going to get off on that. But all means all, all scripture. Now, um, the thing is, is that 2 Timothy was written in AD 66, 67, something like this. It was Paul's last letter. And, uh, and by, uh, during that time period, the four books that we call the Gospels that are uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, birth and ministry um, were written after, actually later. Um, and so there wasn't scripture that Timothy had except the Old Testament. Uh, <clears throat> if you remember the book of Acts, the apostles were abiding in the word they said it's not good for us to neglect prayer in the word because that's what they were supposed to do and i'm telling you the only answer that you got for that is what we falsely and wrongly call the old testament um, i will give one other uh, verse with this if you turn to john 5 Um, 46 and 47, as they just read for us there. If you had believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Listen to what Jesus is saying. He said, if you do not believe his writings... How, you, how will you believe my words? Jesus is, so, is stating something very clearly, that the basis for understanding the New Testament, Jesus' statements in particular, the basis is understanding the writings of Moses, and specifically um, what, he, what he wrote was what the Jews called Torah, uh, the law and God's law I I grew up in church with people reacting to it <clears throat> I as I got older the people react to it we're not under that we're not under that uh, there's even a song that Miss Davis and I noticed in a uh, hymnal that is uh, free from the law oh happy condition and uh, needless to say, it's not one of our favorites. Um, we react to those words, God's law, because we 
don't know what God intended and what he means in his law. We have actually come to believe that God's law um, is uh, walls that imprison us. And actually, the walls of, it's a walls of fortress that protect us. They are not regulations of the way we should act. I mean, people everywhere, I, I'll, I'm going to go keep and they'll by that mean obey the law. And uh, anyway, this, this is, you find out that you can't. You find out that it, that's foolishness. And uh, God is just with his law saying, here's the way things work. If you do those things, James calls it the, the law of liberty. Uh, you are within those things. Uh, you'll be free. Now, <clears throat> we know we can't obey them, but that's one of the reasons that Christ came. And, and we talked about that before, and uh, specifically in Romans 8, verse 4, that we're not saved by doing the law. We are saved to do the law. Um, what's the purpose of a Savior that's supposed to save you from sins? Um, or as Titus says, that what he did was redeem us from every lawless deed. What would be the purpose of a Savior that I say, okay, I receive you, I'm forgiven today and in the past, um, but now that I'm forgiven, I can go ahead and violate the law that would define that I broke in the first place. It, it's also amazing to me that people will say we're, that the law has been done away. Some people will actually go so far as that Jesus, when Jesus came, the law was done away with completely. And so we kick the law out. And I honestly wonder, okay, what's the, what's the catch there? I mean, what, what is the deal? Why is it that uh, we, the very thing that God said, you violated my law, so I had to send my son, and we say, well, once I accept the son, I can go and sin as much as I want to. Go and do what I want. Um, and we're, we are going to talk about this uh, a little bit anyway. The first thing we want to do is give us a few definitions. Again, scripture you need to have marked. Turn to 1 John 3, 4. Ms. Davis, will you read that for us? Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Okay. Uh, the definition of sin, according to the Bible, is that it is lawlessness. Um, there are a group of people that uh, say God's law has been done away with, and we're, yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and yet we have a New Testament writer in one of the last books that was, was written in the New Testament and uh, the longest living uh, apostle who wrote a definition, sin is lawlessness. And uh, even in John, no, I mean Matthew 7, when Jesus is saying, depart from me, you... Uh, the King James will say workers of iniquity, but the word there for iniquity that they translate iniquity is actually not iniquity. It's lawless, uh, anomia, lawless. And uh, so it, it's, he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's, that's what it, is, it says. So uh, we've, we can see here sin is lawlessness, but I, I want to talk also about what the word sin in the Hebrew and the Greek means. And to me, it's one of those things that you go, wow, okay, it's being said twice. The, uh, in both the Greek and the Hebrew scriptures, the specific word for sin is actually simply means missing the mark. And where you see the word sin, you could put in missing the mark. And so a, a more literal thing, somebody came up, well, let's use the word sin. Okay, fine. Um, but 
we have to know what sin is. We have John telling us it's lawlessness, and the specific definition of the words, Hebrew and Greek, translated sin, both of them mean missing the mark. Now, I'm telling you that missing the mark is not going out and try to obey God's law. Uh, that's crashing and burning. But um, the fact is, is that the missing of the mark is the missing of God himself. Uh, I don't think we realize how, how important that is to know. God says, you missed the mark. Okay? Is the mark his law? Actually, it's not. The mark is him. It's, it's his life in you. And so, with his life in you, I mean, do the math. Do you remember the quotation from Paul Worth, Miss Davis? This is the... There, this is, is what is Christianity? What is truth? God in Christ, Christ in man. Yeah, that's it. God in Christ, Christ in man. George MacDonald. Um, May I say something? It's the oh. law, that is the law of liberty. It's not uh -huh. the outward trying to do the outward works of the law. It's the inward working of God in us is the law of liberty. It says stands there stand steadfast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. And it's standing in the liberty that is Christ living in me, the fulfillment of the law. I'm not trying to do it. I'm receiving him as my life. And in that, the Spirit has written the law on my heart. And everything that the Spirit is, is there's no law against that. It says that, that there's no law against it all that God, all that the Spirit does in us. So, however, I don't remember the exact verse. I can look as, at it. As always, Miss Davis stole all the good parts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I read ahead. No, I didn't. Uh, but she's exactly right. Uh, again, you, you think about it. Christ, God is inside Christ. And so in covenant, this is why this is, this teaching is coming up right now. In covenant, we're one with Christ. He becomes one with us. And he said, my father and I are what? One. Wow. How about that? So if Christ is in me, so is God. This is, this is exciting stuff because what's happened is uh, that mankind has been given the spirit of the living God, what we would call the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit is not there for the church's entertainment. Uh, it's not there for us to, if we clap loud enough well, and, and sing and shout and roll around a little bit, wow, we've finally got the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's obviously not, but it is God in Christ, Christ in man, and, and therefore We've, we've got God. So there's sin. Sin, missing the mark. Sin, lawlessness. I want to talk about mercy because there are many in the church, and I told this the other day, it keeps coming up to me, my mind about this, this story. We went and I preached at a particular church uh, in Oklahoma, and I taught, I basically taught what I'm teaching right here. When I finished, the pastor literally leaped out of his throne and uh, up front and went to the microphone. He said, but there is grace. Um, I'm sure he didn't hear a thing I said because he'd been to seminary. He knew that uh, grace does away with the law. I mean, he, you could tell he was visibly upset that I had said the things that I said. And one, one of the reasons I want to define mercy is because we have taken God's mercy and faith 
uh, or rather grace, and made them the same. We've taken the word faith and grace to mean the same thing. And we, we, we mix them all around. Mercy is forgiveness, leniency, not imputing the penalty of a law broken. Not imputing the penalty of a law broken. We could easily say, but I've received Christ. Okay, what happened with Christ? The reason that you receive him is because he died for you. Okay, this is, why did he die for you? Because I violated the law. But wait a second, I'm a Christian, there is no law. I thought Christ came along and did away with all of that. All of that old thing is gone, except it's not true. Uh, note, when I defined leniency, forgiveness, or when I defined mercy, I'm sorry, Lean, uh, linear, thuff. okay, starting over. This is like yesterday, um, doing music. Um, forgiveness, all right, uh, is the mercy we're talking about. The word mercy, forgiveness, leniency, not imputing the penalty of a law broken. Please note, it is not the law has been thrown out. You don't go into court and you killed so and so. Well. Yeah, well, the court has decided that we are throwing that particular law out, which, of course, a lot, there's, this is actually going on in our country right now. These uh, district attorneys are literally turning uh, murderers back out on the streets with no bail, nothing else going on at all. And people are, are dying because the, the, the people that are supposed to be keeping the criminals are, are giving them mercy, of course, it's really not. But and they'll look at themselves and go, "Aren't we merciful? Aren't we nice?" And the victims and the victims' families are going, "What?" But what about me? The thing is, we you find out you don't count. The law is forgiven. It's not annulled. God's law, what we did wrong, is forgiven, but not annulled, thrown thrown out, or done away with. That's mercy. Grace. Now that one, we're going to have to settle for a much shorter definition than it actually is. Um, and we're not going to say uh, that it's, it's just favor, um, because it is, but it's, it's also not. Uh, grace is the desire and the power, and that's a really short definition, not complete by any means, but the desire and the power to do God's will. Um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, y'all turn over there. I know we're running around in Scripture a lot, but these are important verses that we're looking at. 1 Corinthians 15. Ms. Davis, would you read verse 10? Could I read 9, too? <sighs> this is going to be a long day. Go ahead. For I am the least of the apostles. I love these verses. Anyway, <laughs> who, uh, who am not fit to be called apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. That's, I labored, but, oh wait, it wasn't me. It was the grace in me. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, when you do a study of grace, one of the first things that you begin to realize is that grace is a person. Grace is a person, uh, the person of Yeshua. And if, and it is, uh, the desire and power to do God's will, if that is so, he's the one, Ms. Davis has already said it, that's doing the, the uh Doing, doing the doing, how about that, of God's law. Uh, if well, Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 12, and you can read verse 9 there. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. These are interesting verses. We're not going to go into uh, Paul's thorn in the flesh or anything like that. But, but you, God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. 
My grace is sufficient. Because Paul was saying, I want you to remove this thorn in my flesh. And God said, I don't need to do that. You've got me and my, my grace, my, the fact that my life is in you, that will take care of that. It is something that doesn't make you function very well. It's something that irritates you and maybe everybody else. It may be something uh, in his body. I personally believe that it was uh, not a physical ailment, but it was, I think we could look at it this way, and I, I could bring up a lot of scriptures that proved me right. Um, but it was his pride. Um, you, I mean, he says it. Yeah. He literally says it, you know, so that I would not boast and, and the, all these things that have happened. And um, I think he absolutely hated it, but it just owned him uh, in such a, a strong way. But that's a different, different teaching. Uh, we see that power, what's, what's it mean? Why, why power? I thought, what are we talking about? Grace is a power. Grace is a power. Mercy is forgiveness. It's not taking a, the penalty and giving it to that person. That, that's mercy. Grace is something different than that. Are we, we are forgiven by God's mercy. But grace is a power uh, that lives within us that is, and as I said, it, it's Jesus Christ. And as such, mercy comes into our life first. I'm forgiven. But when you are forgiven, the grace is now in you, which is Jesus Christ. It's a, you, we've been studying covenant. Why are you forgiven? Because you were passed over. Why? Because our Passover lamb was sufficient. We are in Christ. Justified in Christ. He is our covering. You want to put it, you know, the, the inside here, this is you, okay? Well, y'all probably have never sinned, so this will be just be me. And here I am, before God, I'm a sinner. But I've exchanged cloaks with Jesus Christ. What, is, what does Father see? Okay, in, in the blood covenant, it lo he looks, oh, there's my son. What's underneath the, the cloak? Ugh. But I'm covered. Justification. Justification. And this, these verses where he's talking with Paul, and Paul is saying, what he told me is his grace was sufficient, is that I'm not going to get rid of this thing, whatever that is that's inside you. And it's going to irritate you. It's going to bug you. And it's going to require you to do what? Seek my face more. Seek my face. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Thirteen, verse 13, Ms. Davis. For it is God who is at work in you to, both to will and to do work for his good pleasure. Okay. Again, we, we belong to, to God uh, through uh, Jesus Christ because Jesus belongs to him. He's in us. God gets us and we get God. Um, May I read another uh, verse? <laughs> give me long. your grace. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think, I love this, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony, and that's a witness of, of his life in them, the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any grit gift awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just, I like that one because it says, this is, you've been enriched in everything in him through this grace that's been given to you. Hey, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, uh, what, 
I'm sorry, where, where's that again? Give That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians verse, 1. 1 Corinthians uh, 1. 4 through yeah. 6. So those are important verses also. Uh, turn to 3 Timothy. That would be Titus. 3 Timothy, Titus chapter 2, please. And uh, Miss Davis, read starting in 11. Uh, to the end of the chapter. Okay. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. These these verses are stunning. I mean, I, I don't know how many semesters we just said, okay, Titus, that's it. That We just revolving around there. <clears throat> Verse 11. The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Now, I didn't say all men are saved. It's just bringing salvation. It's there if you want it. Okay? Um, uh, and don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, don't, don't pass out the Calvinists because I get it that I would not make the right decision because I'm enslaved to Satan. This is a different thing altogether, but the fact is, is that God... Um, will set me free, give me a new nature to make the correct choice. And it's called the new birth, the, that we get in Christ again. But if we look in 11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. He's brought salvation to all men. Not everyone is saved, but all men, salvation is there for them. And then he goes, and I want to point something out. It's brought salvation to all men. There I am again, and there's the justification. But then he goes in in verse 12 and says something different. Look at verse 12. Instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires. So that's the, one of the first things that it does. I'm covered in his grace. Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Justification. It's a J word. Justification. I'm covered with Christ. And this, this is the salvation that's been brought to me. I am actually just. I know you, you know me, and I'm not actually just. I, I'm a sinner, period. And that's not a brag. That's something that, that should bother me. And it does, and we get to the next verse. Doing what? Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Well, ungodliness is being not like God, and the worldly desires is everything around you. Um, this is what grace is doing. If all, if all grace does to you is this, and unfortunately it's become that in uh, the evangelical community, um, I'm not even going to say what the ecumenicals do, but anyway, it's you get that grace. It covers you. He is the you're exchanging your cloak. He gets my flesh, I get his. And and that cloak I put on, and God sees me this way. Okay, you're justified. You're in Christ. Good. But if we do not go beyond justification, and you are not being sanctified, in other words, set aside, separating from the world, and then you haven't got God's grace. You, you have to wonder, was I saved? If I continue on in the way that I uh, was. Verse 12 tells us this. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. Verse 12, and that, that grace does something else. Not just covering us up, but that grace now is... Uh, instructing us to do something. 